Um, we are here for a reason. So uh, we are here for a reason and not because of our own selves. It's because God has brought us here as we heard from Brother Daniel. But we want to see everything that we do um, should have a goal. Does it make sense? Everything that we do should have a goal. If we don't have a goal, then it becomes meaningless. So now we say that we are preparing for the return of Christ. And even for that, we should have a goal, brothers and sisters. If you don't have a goal, then that also becomes meaningless. Because we have a lot of expectation and when something does not happen the way we want, then we are surprised. And we say, oh, our faith goes down. So let's have that goal. May the Lord help us to have or set a goal. Apparently, there was this uh, veteran, a mountain climber. You know, he was sharing his experience to this uh, bunch of people. For the first time, they are going to do a major climb. Because these guy, this guy, he himself has conquered a lot of, uh, you know, world's topmost peaks. So he was qualified to give some advice to this bunch of people, the group of people. You know what he said? Let me read this out to you. He said, remember... Your goal is to experience the acceleration of climb and the joy of reaching the peak. Each step draws you closer to the top. But this is, how, this is what I want you to notice. If your, purpose is, if, if your purpose for climbing is just to avoid death, your experience will be minimal. If our purpose for going or preparing for Christ's return is just to overcome sin, your experience and my experience on this earth will be very minimal. But God does not want us to have or be a minimal Christians. Amen. He wants us to give us that abundant life. Amen. Enjoy the life Amen. in Christ Jesus, not in the world. That's important. As we approach the end days, we see that a lot of people are going away from the pure devotion for Christ. Do you see that? Yes. We all see that and we all acknowledge it. But we don't accept when it comes to us, isn't it? We always like to acknowledge when, when we see it on others. But when it comes to us, unfortunately, we don't want to acknowledge it. We say, oh, elders are not good and builders are not good and this is not good, that is not good. We like to blame others. So I really hope that may the Lord speak to us today and let us take the blame and repent so that we can have this abundant life. Okay. Now, I don't know about how soon Jesus Christ will return, but looking at the things that are happening, we see that Jesus Christ will return soon. Amen. But I know one thing. Time-wise, I don't know how long, but space-wise, I know he's going to return soon. You know why? Okay. Let me give you a test. All right? Are you all ready? I'll give you a verse. If you know the answer, just raise your hands. You should not say, say it out. If you know the answer, just raise, it, raise your hands. Isaiah 66, 1. If you know the answer, just raise your hand. No? Okay. Then Lord should tarry. <laughs> okay. Turn with me to Isaiah 66, 1, please. It's a well-known verse, brothers and sisters. Uh, no condemnation. Let's read it. Let's know this verse by heart. Uh, Isaiah 66, 1. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you can build for me? You, we have such a big, humongous, huge God somewhere hidden. So as I said, time-wise, I don't know, but space-wise, you know how far he is? He just has to open the door. Does it make sense? He's that close. And also that gives me a comfort that... When I pray, my dad is listening on the next door and he will answer. So you don't have to be worried. I don't have to be worried. Let's focus on what, how to prepare for this, the second return of the Christ. There are two things. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can do to prepare, but I just want to just share two things as the Lord has laid it in my heart. So if you can just be a little attentive. This is a higher life. We are not looking at, as I mentioned, it's not just a menial Christian life that we want to live. We want to live a higher ground. Amen. So let's look at these two things. And if we can grip by that, I'm sure the Lord will be able to help us to grow and know Him more and worship Him more and be prepared for His coming. 
Turn with me to Psalms, please. This is the first thing that we had to do. Psalms chapter 2. Verses 12. Psalms 2 verse 12. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. And you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled by a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. You can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. You can never learn Christ is all you need until we learn Christ is all we have. We need to understand that. So here it says, kiss the sun. If you read this chapter, chapter 2, this is Messiah's triumph, Messiah's victory. At the end of it, it says, kiss the son, lest he be angry. So we want to just think about this. What does kissing the son mean? According to this verse, kissing the son means worshipping God. Kissing the son means worshipping God. Now, today we need to learn how to worship God. Do you know what it means by worshiping, uh, what, what it means to say that we are worshiping God? Not when we sing songs, not when we have loud music, not when we all say, oh, praise the Lord. No, no. Worshiping God means we'll see what worshiping God is. Um, I want to see there is a picture that is depicted in New Testament. If you turn with me to Luke's Gospel, please, chapter 7. This is what the real worship that was accepted by Jesus himself. And that was appreciated by Jesus himself. So if you turn with me to Luke 7, verse 36 to 50. Here is a woman. I don't have much time. Let me try and give you just a brief idea. Here is a woman. She's not educated. She's not eloquent. She's considered as a person who is a sinner. She's a prostitute. And she's downtrodden. But she meets the Lord. But what she does is, she takes a, we know the stories very well, she takes the oil, comes to Jesus, and then washes his feet with, his, with her tears, and then she pours this oil on his feet, and anoints him, and Jesus accepted worship. What do we learn from this? What is it something that we can understand from this and prepare for Christ's return? How does this correlate to that? That's what we are going to see. We need to understand something, the most acceptable thing is kissing the feet of Jesus. The most acceptable thing is kissing the feet of Jesus. That means worshipping God. What, what do we see here? You know what A.W. A. 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 Tozer said? The driver on the highway is safe not when he reads the signs, but only when he obeys the rules. Amen. It's exactly the same when it comes to scriptures as well. If you know scriptures, if you know songs, if you know how to say praise the Lord, brother, and all these language, as Brother Sam mentioned, brother, my, my dear brother, sister, we may not be with the, Jesus, with Lord, with the Lord Jesus eternally. That's right. We have to obey. Amen. And obey in what? Not just saying, oh, brother, I'm trying to overcome sin, I'm falling, again, I'm trying to overcome sin. I ask Jesus, yeah, that's good, that's the beginning. But that should not be our life, brothers. We should go to another uh, extent, Amen. that is kissing the feet of Jesus. Amen. So what happened is this lady, she comes to this, this guy called Simon. He's a Pharisee. You know who is a Pharisee? A man who knows all the traditions on this earth. A man who knows scripture well. A man who can even quote scripture to Jesus, like how devil quoted scripture to Jesus. And this man, he invites Jesus to come into his house. And he prepared a meal for him. Wow. Because he thought Jesus will appreciate the meal that he's going to prepare for him. And when he prepared the meal, Jesus walks in and then he sits there. But Jesus does not appreciate whatever he said or whatever he did. You know, in the corporate world, we have this tagline called attention to detail. I don't know how many of you have come across that. Attention to detail. Do you know Jesus' attention to detail as well? He's very specific of each and every one here. That's why when Brother Daniel said, we are not here by chance. We are not here by chance. So maybe God wants to speak to you. God wants to meet with you. Amen. So what you have to do is, 
You need to be ready. And this woman was ready. You know what she did? She got some oil from what? The money that she sold her own body, what she earned from prostitution, she got that oil and comes to Jesus. This is what I want you to notice. Please read with me. Um, so Luke chapter 7. Remember, we are talking about returning the Christ, I mean, preparing for the return of Christ. Here is a sinful woman, verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat on the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of oil. And she stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. And she kissed his feet, anointed them with the fragrant oil. But when she did all this, you know what the, what the guy who had the Bible knowledge said? No, oh, this is a sinful woman. Why is Jesus allowing her to touch him? Why is Jesus allowing to do all this? But you know what Jesus said? Here is a parable, verse 41. Uh, verse 40 it starts. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. Verse 41 there, he said, certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed five denarii and the other owed 50. When they had nothing with which no, to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love more? Here you go. The answer is very clear. He immediately bursted out saying, wow, you know, the guy who, whom the money is forgiven more. Jesus said, you who are rightly judged. Verse 44, it says, then he turned to the woman and said, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water. You gave me no water to wash my feet. But she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. What do we understand by this? When it comes to worship, you know what this woman does? She takes hold of the feet of Jesus. If you're kissing the feet of someone, someone, if you're greeting someone, you kiss them on the cheek, isn't it? We are all a bunch of people, maybe, where we are greeting Jesus by just kissing his face. But instead, if you are preparing to go meet him, we should learn how to kiss his feet. What does that mean? If you are going to kiss someone's feet, you're not going to be standing. You're not even going to be sitting. You're going to be fallen off at his feet. And you take, the, take all of the feet. And you're not speaking any words. You're not singing any songs. You're looking at that feet and just kissing that feet. This is a real worship. And Pharisees, people who have Bible knowledge, they did not understand this. But a prostitute understood that. Today you and I can be that prostitute. world can say that you are a fool. But brother, sister, do you have that attitude to fall at his feet and then say, Lord Jesus, I don't want anything. I don't even have rights to look at your face. Let me kiss your feet. Amen. I'll pour out everything that I have. She went and sold everything that she probably has and then she got that oil. Here is a man who has so much of money, so much of Bible knowledge, so much of tradition, so much of church, so much of singing, so much of everything, but he did not know what to do when he, when he invited Jesus. You have invited Jesus, have you brother? You have invited Jesus, have you sister? Are you kissing him like this woman? Or are you being like Pharisee that you are trying to tell, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm going to church, I'm doing this, I'm giving money. Are you proud about what you're doing? You know what Jesus had to say? I'm sorry, I don't like that. I don't accept that. But if you're like this woman, see what Jesus says. I want to tell you something, if you really love Jesus with all your heart, if you really worship him, God will give you an opportunity to do something to him where no one on this earth can do to him. And what do I mean by that? Please read this word, verse 47. 
it says therefore i say to her the sins which are many are forgiven she loved me much do you want to get that honor a certificate from jesus himself matthew loves me much doesn't matter who love me but matthew loves me much brother sister do you know what john the apostle he was so much in love of Je- love for jesus he started off his career as a cousin of jesus and then he became a disciple of jesus and then he became one of the closest disciple of jesus and not only that when there was a problem he wrote the gospel of john if you go to the entire world and in christian world and ask them next to psalm 23 the greatest verse that people quote is john 3:16 isn't it this man god has anointed him so much this man he loved jesus so much he went after jesus want to know him more and more and more and more and he loved jesus so much and god gave him an opportunity to write john's gospel not only that he gave him an opportunity to write epistle three epistles not only that he took him to patmos and he made him gave him the revelation to write but even him jesus did not appreciate saying he he loved me much but here is this woman jesus said she loved me much do you love him or do you just trying to kiss him by just greeting him yeah we are happy we are happy to say i'm a christian my dear brothers and sisters true worship is when you fall at his feet and take hold of his feet and kiss him that's what you're going to do in heaven you're not going to be someone there you're not going to be you know honored there in heaven no it's only jesus amen it's only jesus let's learn to be like this woman it's okay the world can say you are someone stupid doesn't matter this woman was called as a prostitute she did not care she said lord i will hold on to your feet what a wonderful god we have and don't you see that jesus notices the heart of that woman lord of brothers and sisters we are here with lot of emotions i'm not condemning anyone please don't get me wrong let's have the heart for jesus amen let's have the heart for jesus see jesus is worshiped in the in heavens eternally it's not one day two day for long and long and long of times he is worshiped in the heavens but he appreciated this woman when she came and worshiped him he is happy to appreciate you my dear brother he is happy to appreciate you my dear sister only provided if you are willing to be like her if you are willing to give everything for jesus Amen. then you know how to worship him if not i'm really sorry to say there will come a day there will be a big surprise to you and to me you can have a good testimony good certificate from all the brothers and sisters your church can say you are a wonderful, wonderful person your church can give you an opportunity to do use your gifts but unfortunately god will not give you any certificate he will find faults with you he will say what you did was for yourself it was not for me martha was so busy occupied in doing so many activities lord lord i'll do this i'll do that god said he rebuked her he said you are worried about so many things come here sit at my feet amen come here sit at my feet are you busy with oh brother i want to go do this i want to do that i want to do this for the lord no come here just come here i see your heart i know you love me but that does that is not the real love don't copy someone else come here copy copy this woman she loved me much i have to say we should be ashamed that we still haven't got into that level of maturity in worshiping god don't get me wrong i'm not trying to tell anyone condemn anyone i'm talking to myself as well lord i'm sorry i've repented okay we don't want to just hold on to that we want to go to the next one what is the second important thing that we should do when christ is returning how do we prepare please turn with me to john uh, psalms psalm 16 this is a well known verse i really hope you all know this verse psalm 16 verse 11 it says you show me the path of life in your presence is a fullness of joy at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore in your presence there is 
fullness of joy. Can you answer? Because I don't want anyone to sleep. <laughs> so, yes. In your presence, there is fullness, fullness of joy. Of joy. Amen. This is what David wrote. Okay? But do you know what Jesus did? You know who we are supposed to be like? Whom do we replicate on this earth? No, no, no. We will replicate some preachers. Whom are we supposed to replicate? Oh, no, no. That church is really good. Let, let us replicate that. No. We are supposed to replicate Jesus. And uh, brother, how do you say that? Okay, I'll show you some verses. Uh, 1 John. 1 John. Chapter 2, verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. If you say you abide in Christ, you know what happens is most of the time, it is not Christ abiding in us. Christ, Christ is just visiting us. That is a problem with us. So whenever we come to a meeting like this or come to a Sunday meeting or a prayer meeting, oh, Christ met with me, brother. Then again, it's, he's all gone. It should not be visiting. It should be abiding. Amen. It should be abiding in us. He should be able to glorify himself in and through our lives. Amen. So I, just as he walked, we are supposed to walk. Not only that. So First John chapter 4, 17, it says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So as he walked, we are supposed to walk. As he is, so are we in this world. If we are not like him, if we don't have the life of Christ in us, if the world does not see Christ in us, what are we here for, brothers? What are we doing? You are saying that you are preparing for Christ's return. Where? In what way is Christ seen in you? But you know what Jesus did? Because we have to follow him. Please turn with me to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 verse 2. Now what are we supposed to do? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith, who for joy that was set before him. I want you to listen to this. Psalm 11, 6, uh, Psalm 1611 we see, in your presence, there is what? Fullness of joy. Now, now we as brothers and sisters, we look unto Jesus and run. Now, what is Jesus looking at, uh, looking at and running? He is looking at the joy. That is what? His presence. God's presence is what? Jesus is looking at and running. Every moment of his life, Jesus was only concerned about that presence of his father. Amen. What are we supposed to do? We are supposed to always have his presence. If you are in his presence, if God is in your presence, what will be there? There will be fullness of joy. There will be bubbling of joy from you. You may not have, you may not be an extrovert. You may not just go tap everyone and then say hello and all that. No, I'm not a person like that. I just keep quiet. But inside you, there will be a joy bubbling. That will bubble and overflow, brothers. You know, Psalm 26, we know that. Uh, Psalm 23, we know that. Goodness and mercy shall follow you. Do you, when you visit other brothers and sisters, does goodness and mercy follow you? You ask that question to yourself. When I meet this brother, when I have a phone, telephone conversation with this brother or sisters, do you have that goodness and mercy following you all the days of your life? Check. I check myself. Lord, I went and met that brother. I spoke to that brother. I spoke to this person. I don't know if I had goodness and mercy follow me. Was I rude? Was I trying to show myself off? We can always judge ourselves. God will help us. God will help us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, before you take part, what does he say? Examine yourself. Is that right? That is one level of examination. But you know what David says? You know why David was called the man after God's own heart? He exactly did what God intended. Whatever God thought in his heart, this man did it. You know what he says? Create in, search, search my heart, Lord. I can't search. I tried. With my ability, I see whatever I see is right. But I can't search deep within me. Today we can say like, oh brother, I examine myself. Don't be satisfied just with your searching. Ask God, Lord, will you search me? Search my heart, Lord. 
Create in me a clean heart. Let goodness and fo mercy follow all the days of my life. Our goal, our ambition. Firstly, we saw we should be worshipping God. How? Kissing at his feet. No word speaking. No song sing sung. Nothing told. Nothing given. Nothing exchanged. Just kissing at his feet. Secondly, we are, we ought to be like Jesus. Running. Looking unto him. But what was that? There was a presence that he was seeking. You know how you know the tabernacle? How many of you know tabernacle? You know that? There are three pictures. Now we see tabernacle, the first outer court, is what we know, it, uh, know as forgiveness of sins, you know, you, you know, remission of sins and all that. And the second, the holy place, is something where we call it as ministry, serving the Lord, doing his work. But the most holy place, you know what will be there? Only the presence of God. Only the presence of God is there. Even in our lives, we are three parts. One is physical. Second is our intellect. Third is our spirit. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he tore the veil. He rented the veil. You can read it in Hebrews 10, 20. You can read it in uh, Hebrew, yeah, he, Hebrews 10. You will see. You, you can read that verse if you want. Hebrews 10, 20. See what it says. 19, therefore, brethren, having boldness to the enter of holiest by holy, uh, holiest by the blood of Jesus, a new and a living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Because of his flesh, he tore that veil. So now God can enter into our spirit. You know, yesterday I was sitting in the flight. And, uh, you know, I just talked to the Lord and then I, I was like, Old covenant believers are like roadways. New covenant believers are like airways. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you an example. See, if you're in the roadway, you look at the signals, you know, and it goes green, then you drive. But when it comes to airways, you don't look at signals. You wait to hear what the air traffic controller says to you. In our lives, in the new covenant believer, if you are a new covenant believer, you should wait for what the Lord says to you in your heart. You don't wait for some light. Oh, brother, I saw some light, brother. It's wonderful. There are brothers who whole heart. Listen to God in your heart. Listen to God in your heart. Amen. If you don't listen to God in your heart, brother, you're not flying. You're still in the old covenant. You're trying to drive your own car, reckless car here and there. And Let's get into the new covenant life. Amen. Let's seek for the presence of Jesus. You know what? After God created, you know, how, how, how many days did it take for God to create the whole universe? Seven. Seven days? Six. No, six. Seven. Yeah, last one. All the answers are accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I will give you my answer now. <laughs> All right. He took six days for God to create the universe. Seventh day he rested. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what he did was, he created Adam on the sixth day. On the seventh day, what did he say? Be with me. The first day of human life is to what? Be with the Lord. What about Eve? What about Eve? Unfortunately. <laughs> so, what do we understand by this is, as a human being, as a brother or a sister, the thing that we ought to do is be in the presence of the Lord. That's what I'm trying to say. Amen. When you are in the presence of the Lord, no devil came. When you are in the presence of the Lord, no sin entered. When you are in the presence of the Lord, you did not have any problem in finding out whether I'm going to be naked or I'm going to be like this, I'm going to be like that. Nothing. It's only him and you. It's only him and you. It's only him and you. But this is the way how Jesus lived on, his earth, on this earth. But unfortunately, there was one day when he was in the garden. He was crying out, Daddy, can you please pass this off? He said, no. I can't do that. If I do that, there are people in Brisbane. There are people in Melbourne. They won't be able to come to me. And you know what Jesus had to do? That's fine. I leave that presence. 
He left his presence because of you and me, so that we can get to that presence. Are you taking it light or are you taking it really seriously? What is your life, brothers? How are you enjoying in the presence of God? Let's always be there. Can you imagine when you go to the presence of God in the old covenant, the tabernacle, you will only see the glory of God. There is a glory that comes. There is a glory that shines. You are not there on your own. It is God who is preeminent there. The preeminence is given only to God, who is the creator of heaven and earth. And he said, can you imagine the whole universe? He chose to stay, come and dwell in one place. That is the most holy place. Today he is choosing to come and dwell in your heart. That is the most holy place. Are you willing to give him the room? Or are you saying, no, 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 no. This decision I will make. Continue making the decision. There will come a day you will have to cry. There will come a day you will no longer be able to get to that presence. There will come a day because you are taking it easily, because you are taking it light, because you are enjoying the pleasures of the world, you will not be able to get into his presence again. It's very dangerous. No. You are saying, Lord, I am expecting for your return. Yeah, he is coming back. But he is not going to get you. He is going to get those people. You know, to read this word. This is a beautiful word. Psalm chapter 14. Can you imagine the heart of God? Psalm 14, verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there is anyone who understands and who seek God. Is there anyone who understands here, brothers? Are you seeking God? He is seeking after you. Amen. But because of our foolishness, because of our sins, He cannot come closer to us. Let me give you an example. I shared this in the Melbourne church. There are three lives we all play. One is public life. Second is personal life. And thirdly, private life. Public life is what we are in front of others, in front of the whole world, in front of the church. Personal life is what we are in the house, where you are there, your close family is there. And you know who is also there? Satan is also there. But private life is only you in your mind and God. If you are not seeking Jesus in your private life, you will not be able to seek him in your personal life or in your public life. Does it make sense? There are three realities that we have on this earth. God, people, things. God, people, things. We are bound to worship God. We are bound to love people. We are bound to use things. But you know what we do? We worship people. We love things, we use God. We worship people, we love things, we use God. If your private life, in your private life, no one can see that private life. It's just you and God. In your private life, if you begin to seek the presence of God, in your private life, if you are always at his feet worshipping him, I'll tell you, brother, your life will shine as a light. Your life will grow, glow for the glory of God. And when Christ returns, you will be waiting to be lifted up. If not, you will have to run away. You have to run away from yourself. But I said, Lord, yeah, this is right. But what about Jesus? Do you know what? How God, as, I, as we just read in Isaiah 66, 1, such a big God is hidden somewhere. The same big God, he is also hidden the life of Christ. Have you seen? He's hidden the life of Jesus Christ. 30 years is hidden completely. When I said, Lord, how do I understand this? You know what did God say? He said, yes, if you try to seek me, you will only get to know my public life. If you try to be a wholehearted, a little bit wholehearted, you will get to know a little bit of personal life. But you really get to seek me. Then the Holy Spirit will reveal his private life. Am I saying my words? Read in your Bible, John 16, 14. The Holy Spirit will come 
and take of what is in me and reveal it to you. How? Only when you seek. Only when we seek that private life. Oh no, brother, I'm happy with Jesus' public life. Okay. No, brother, I'm, I know about Jesus. I know about Bible theology. Okay. Be satisfied with what you are. Devil is so happy for us to be satisfied with what we know, what we are. He does not want us to go, grow closer. I have this word, you know, A.W. Tozer. He said it. Nothing bothers the devil more than a Christian delighting in the presence of God. Nothing bothers. If you delight in God's presence, it bothers him. Do you want to be a bother for a devil or do you want to be a bother of Jesus Christ? Let's change our attitude. Let's ch change. Not from my head. Oh, I heard a good message. Oh, that was a good song. No, that's just emotions. Let our heart change. God is not a God of mind. God is not a God of my physical appearance. God is not a God of activities. God is a God of heart. He looks at your heart, my heart. My parents cannot see my heart. My church brothers and sisters cannot see my heart. No one can see your heart. Only God and you know your heart. If you really get to his presence, you know what you will see? You will see more of yourself. And you will see more of him. What a union that is. When you come here like this to the church, I'll tell you, my brothers and sisters, Presbyterian Church will glow as a real light. Amen. The whole world can be dark, but our church can be glowing as a light for Christ. Amen. And when God seeks from heaven, he'll be able to see, there my son is, there my daughter is. God is a God who is attention to detail. You really seek, you seek him from your heart. He said, draw it close to me, I will draw close to you. James 4.8 don't worry about anything else. When a lion is chasing a rabbit, lion is running after the rabbit for one meal, but rabbit is running for its life. Does it understand? Do you understand that? Yeah. When lion is chasing a rabbit, lion is running after one meal, but rabbit is running after entire life Satan can make us fall in one sin that is just one meal for him just one person for him but your entire life will be gone what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary will mean nothing to you let's change I heard a story like this there was a woman who had a pet you know in Australia there are a lot of pets weird pets <laughs> <laughs> so, don't worry, I'm an Australian now, so I have all the <laughs> So, this man, uh, sorry, this lady, she had this pet of a snake. The snake was really very close to her, and she was trying to, you know, take care of the snake for a long time. And the snake started growing. And uh, because they were so close to each other, it came to a point that uh, she could even understand the senses of snake. You know what I mean? How when you get so close to your dog and something, you get to sense the dog is hungry or the dog is, you know, not happy and all that. But it so happened after a few months, this woman, uh, when she was feeding the snake and the snake did not eat anything. And the snake is growing weary and kind of tired and trying to, she almost felt like the snake is dying. Oh, so the, she takes the snake to the veterinary doctor and the doctor tests and everything. And then she says, oh, probably some, some poisoning or something, some infection. So they inject all this and everything is fine. And then after a week, she gets the snake back home. But after six or seven months, the snake is so close to her now. The pet snake is so close to her. And after so many months and again, the same thing happened. The snake is almost dying. She's so terrified. I have only one friend, I'm not even married. I have only one friend, even that friend is about to die. What do I do? Again, call the pet, vet, vet and the vet comes and he does all the things and he says, I don't know, there's nothing wrong with the snake. And the veterinary doctor says, okay, let me do one thing. I will take this snake and put it in the observation for two days and I'll let you know what exactly the problem is. She was so happy, but she was worried. What do I do? What do I do? She, two days she could not sleep, she could not eat. And then the third day, she gets a call from the doctor. I have a good news and I also have a bad news. 
what is the first news you want me to share with you? She said, what is the good news? She said, your snake is perfectly fine. Now, what is the bad news? You know what the vet said? The snake was preparing itself to eat you alive. Are you enjoying in sin? Are you living the life what the world wants you to live? Are you living the pleasures of your flesh? It will all be fine. A day will come. The same pet, the same flesh, the same sin will eat you. You will have no other option. Are you preparing for the Christ's coming? Do you want to prepare? I'll tell you another story because story seems to work a lot. It will stay in our mind. It seems there was a wise man in the village. And this wise man, what he did was, whatever people have problems, when they come to him, he will give some solutions. Good solution, wise man. So, this has been happening for like 40, 50 years. And all of a sudden, there was this young man who rose up and he said, no, I want to prove this guy wrong. He's been cheating the whole village for past 40 years now. Let me prove, my, uh, prove him wrong. So what he did was, he invited the whole village and made them stand in front of him. And he said, guys, all this while he's been cheating you. The entire village was shocked. They were looking up to him like a guru. Guru means some master but all of a sudden someone is saying that what he's saying is wrong oh what is it they were all shocked and they were eagerly waiting and uh, this guy what he did he took a bird in his hand a small bird in his hand he hid it behind him and he asked this master he said tell me now the bird that i have is it alive or dead if the wise man said it is dead he will prove the bird is alive. But if the wise man said the bird is alive, he'll prove, he'll kill the bird and show that the bird is dead. So in any way, wise man will be caught. This is his, this is his attitude to find out fault in him. But you know what wise man said? It is in your hands. So whatever I shared or whatever, the, whatever God spoke to you today, we can't make any changes. It is all in your hands. You take it, you leave it. A day will come. That day will show us whether we really heeded the voice of the Lord or whether we heeded the voice of ourselves. May the Lord speak to us and help us. Praise be to his name.